Welcome to St. James, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for being here uh, to, to enjoy an awesome performance of an incredible choir. And I truly thank them and all the work you guys have put in here since January. Um, but hopefully the words they sing, the words you hear about what happened at a particular time, at a particular place when God entered our story and rescued it. So may God bless your ears and your hearts as we follow our Lord to the cross um, for us. Let us rise. Almighty God, graciously behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men, to suffer death upon a cross through the same Jesus Christ, we pray, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what they heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made a grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. Yet shall he see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let's rise and pray. O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, O Christ, God the Father in heaven, God the Son, the Redeemer of the world, God the Holy Spirit, be gracious to us, be gracious to us. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death, by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, we poor sinners implore you to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. to raise those who fall, to strengthen those who stand, comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We implore you to hear us, Lord. To give all peoples, especially this city, concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. to forgive our enemies, persecutors and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Christ the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The first words of Christ. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one.
you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So Good Friday focuses on one central thing, one image, one idea, and that is the cross. The crucifixion is at the center of today, and it's at the center of Christian spirituality. I'd encourage you, uh, just take a minute and look around our sanctuary at how many crosses are present in the uh, artwork and the architecture. The center point of our altar is a cross. Uh, we carry a cross occasionally as a processional uh, tool to focus our spiritual contemplation. The cross is at the center of what Christians do and what we believe. And because the cross is therefore so familiar to us, we lose the scandal, the shocking nature of what the cross is and what it represents. Because of course, originally, it was not a spiritual symbol. It was not an object of religious fascination. The cross was ultimately a tool of Roman shame and torture. Right? We get the word excruciating from crucifixion. These words are linked together. So the cross was this symbol of deep suffering and pain. In fact, the Romans would use this to make sure that whatever you did, nobody would follow after you in terms of that particular venture. And this is exactly why St. Paul refers to the cross as folly to those who are perishing. In other words, from outside the church, it's foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And St. Paul is exactly correct when he says that outside the church, the cross makes no sense, right? It's simply a symbol of shame, of pain, and of suffering. And in fact, those outside the church probably understand it for what it is. But what do we see from within the lens of the, uh, the church, from within the walls of the church? Well, we see that it's the power of salvation, right? That it's uh, the place where Jesus, through his blood and agony, enters into the depths of human despair and suffering in order to redeem it to reclaim it, to atone for the sin of the world, and to bring new life from that very location. The cross is, in many ways, similar to our stained glass. If you look around our sanctuary here for a second, what do we see from within the church? Well, from within the church, we see the story of salvation. We see the brightly illumined narrative of Jesus's life, his death, his resurrection, right? From within the church, that's perfectly clear because the glass is viewed the way it's supposed to be. But from outside of the church, what do we see? It's opaque, right? Unless it's brightly lit from inside, it's difficult to make out what story is being depicted on the glass there. And I think that you can take that same idea and apply it to the earliest uh, depictions of Christ Jesus. In fact, the earliest depiction of Christ Jesus was not by some sort of Christian artist or iconographer, someone making sacred art, at least not intentionally. Instead, the earliest piece of artwork, since art is the theme of this evening, is actually called the Alexamanos Graffiti. 
Uh, it's a graffiti artist who painted on the inside of a cave a depiction of Jesus mocking Christians and their worship of this crucified man. In the eyes of this artist, Jesus is not depicted in a heroic fashion. He does not look like somebody that would be worthy of our adoration. Instead, he's depicted Jesus as having the face of a donkey, and he is putting, being put to death on a uh, very rugged, simple-looking cross. And the caption underneath it says, Alexamanos worships his God in reference to the Christian who is worshiping at the foot of the cross. And in fact, we think this is kind of a depiction of the Roman centurion who sees uh, the moment of the crucifixion and says, truly, this man was the Son of God. And I think this is ultimately a perfect illustration of what we know to be true about the center of Christian spirituality, which comes at the cross. The graffiti artist has actually captured something sacred, although he doesn't understand that. Aleximanos recognizes through faith that this is the moment of salvation, while the artist, absent faith, sees it only as defeat, as what our eyes perceive, of an innocent man put to death for a crime that he didn't commit, a tragedy to be sure, but in his eyes, nothing more significant. So Christians are called through faith to see the significance of what happens at the cross, to see that this moment that looks idiotic to the outside world is in fact the moment when life is won for all. And then, in turn, we are called to follow after Christ. What does that mean? Jesus tells us, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And that's what we do on a day like Good Friday. We deny ourselves. We focus on the theme of repentance. Why was Christ's sacrifice, in fact, necessary? And we follow after Christ Jesus, not in the sense that we are earning anything in our salvation, but rather so we can see the heart of the Christian faith, which is Christ Jesus' work, his sacrifice that's done on behalf of the many. So ultimately, what is Jesus then asking us to do? Jesus is asking the church collectively to take the place of foolishness, to take the place that looks like folly to the outside world, march to the place where we know that life has been won and boldly declare that at the cross, this moment when the Son of God dies, that's the moment when life has been won for the world. You see, the nature of the world that we're a part of means that our sinful nature actually had to be dealt with, right? Our sinful nature had to be put to death. Our sins had to be put to death. And that's why Christ Jesus, in fact, becomes our sin so that that sin would not cling to us, right? God is not content to lead, leave any obstacle in his relationship with us. So what does he do? He goes to the center of human suffering. He goes to the darkest place imaginable in order to remove any obstacle and bring light out of that darkness. And that's the center of that Good Friday idea. And this is what, it lets, what Good Friday lets us see with particular clarity. The first Christians always recognized that Jesus' suffering, in fact, brings about life for the world. And this is why we read those words from Isaiah 53. They recognized that Isaiah was talking about Jesus when he said that this person would bear our sin, would take on our shame, would abide in our suffering so that we might have life so that we might be made righteous by his stripes. We're not wounded, but rather we, the church, are healed. And that is exactly why we boast in the cross. That's why we rejoice in the salvation that it provides, even as others see it only as something shameful. You see, the Father sent the Son into our spiritual shame, into our spiritual defeat, into the grips of death itself, not because he delights in suffering, but rather to bring light from the darkest place imaginable. So now we can call a day like Good Friday good because we can see it for what it is, that we worship like Alexamanos, a God who is crucified, a God who has died in order to now bring life to the world. So Good Friday invites you to focus on that, to remember the fact that God has loved you so much that he enters into the depths of our sinfulness in order that we would now walk in newness of life, illumined by the light of Christ. So focus on that. Let that lens shape the rest of your experience of these readings, of these music pieces, and hear that word once again spoken anew and fresh, that the Son of God has died 
the sin of the world is atoned for, and that you now have life in his name. Amen. Our second word. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man's done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise.
Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home.
Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling for Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come save him.
After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth.
It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. A jar full of sour wine stood there, 
They put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
your evening, your weekend. We'll see you tomorrow for the vigil and for Easter. And thank you, choir. And I think we can give a round of applause for the great sound you did.